All right, so I'm going to be continuing on my series, my doctrinal series of being a peculiar people. I've been doing this pretty much every week, just picking one thing that is going to, if you decide to choose to, to follow God's word, follow his commandments, the outward um, manifestation of your belief and actually um, stick into the word of God, how that is going to look and appear different to the world, to people on the outside, things that will actually ought to be changing in your life or have already been changed. That's going to be a stark contrast or a big difference between the world and how a godly Christian should be behaving. Obviously, there's a lot of other doctrines besides just these ones that are going to outwardly manifest themselves that's going to show such a stark contrast. You know, just things that you believe, things that you believe to be true about the Bible. But we're focusing on the ones that it will actually have an outward difference. And this afternoon, the, the topic or the group I'm going to be dealing with, I call it the, the title of my sermon is Church Life. So there's a few things that I wanted to incorporate this, but all has to do with church. And the number one thing is just church itself. And just the importance of coming to church, making church a priority, and, and doing what you can to, to be in here and kind of be devoted and dedicated to being in church. That alone, that mindset alone is very different from the majority of Christianity as well as the unsaved world. Obviously, the unsaved world, you know, you ask someone what they're going to do on a Sunday, they're going to probably watch a sports game or something, right? Or go out to barbecue, have a birthday party, whatever, all these other things. But you ask someone who's studying the Word and is saved and wants to grow and, and loves the Lord, they're going to tell you, I'm going to be in church. And that's a priority. And we're going to get into the priority aspect in just a minute. But I think... Um, no, I'll just do it right now. The key difference in what's going to make you stand out and be more sanctified and be more of a peculiar person in the world's eyes is when you put that priority on being in church. Where it's not something that's negotiable. It's not something that like you know, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, or maybe on a Saturday, you think, oh, what am I going to do with my day-to-day? -day? I don't know. Maybe I'll go to the park. Maybe I'll go do this. Maybe I'll go have fun and do that. Maybe, you know. When you make the priority that, and you say church is very important, I'm going to make sure I'm going to be there, it's not a question anymore. It's not a choice. You don't wake up in the morning and say, well, I'm going to go to church today. I don't know. I don't kind of feel like it today. It's not one of those decisions that ought to be made just on a whim or whether or not you feel like going. I guarantee you, most of you, if not all of you, hopefully all of you that have jobs and go to work, you don't wake up every day that, and it's your work schedule and you're supposed to go into work and I think, well, I don't know, should I go into work today or not? No, you're gonna go into work, right? I mean, you, you've, you've put an importance on it. You've placed a priority that going to work and providing and getting paid and supporting myself, these are all important things for my life. And I'm going to make sure that that gets done. Well, just as much, if not more, I would say even more important than your very job and making sure you're getting to work on time, getting work done, is making sure you're getting to church and being in church. It is that important. It is not something to be taken just lightly and just tossed around. And, you know, people, I'll get into that in just a minute, but um, I think one of the biggest problems that people have with not putting enough emphasis or not enough priority on making sure that we're getting to church is just a lack of understanding or appreciation for what church really is and what the Bible describes church as. We're, we started off reading in Ephesians chapter 5, and it's because the latter portion of this passage talks a great deal about the importance of church. Now, typically, what you'll hear preached on in that last portion of Ephesians 5 is about husbands and wives because it talks a great deal about the relationship. But it, it's relating that to Christ and the church. So instead of preaching on husbands, I've already, I've already taught on that using this very passage, we're going to look at some of these verses and see the importance now from the other end, right? Because that great truth of, a, of the relationship between a husband and wife it's using the relationship with Christ in the church to give that example and to help us understand how our, our marriage ought to be. But he says here 
in um, verse number 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, we're going to see a few other verses and in in a few other places that talk about this, but the church is literally the body of Christ. And we're going to see that all throughout Scripture. A church is referred to as a body. Jesus Christ is the head of that body. So being the head, that's where the mind is. That's where all the direction comes from, right? Our heads, our minds is what determines what the rest of our body is going to do. If I want to walk over here, my mind is telling my feet to go and do that. My, my mind is going to tell my hand to pick up this cup, to take a drink. Whatever my mind is directing the rest of my body to do, my head's in charge. And the church is the body of Christ. The church is what God uses to get his work done on this earth. And he's using the church. He's not just using you as just some individual off, you know, just deciding, I'm, I'm going to stay away from church. I'm going to stay at my home. You know, that's not the way that he wants to use. He wants to use a church as a body to get the most work done. You're part of the body. You need to be part of the body. That's how we're going to do the most for God. And that's where God wants you to be. That's not to say no one can ever do anything at all for God if they're not in church. But that's not the point. Because that's not where God wants you to be. He wants you to be here. He wants you to be with the body. He wants you working together. And as the head, he wants you to go and do whatever he wants you to do. And we come here to receive that instruction. We come here as the body to receive that instruction from God's word so that we can all be unified as a body working together to get the work done. And when you start thinking about this as the body coming together to get things done for Christ, first of all, that should be a big indicator. Hey, this is actually pretty important. Let's all get on to say, let's all be part of that body that Christ is the head of. Now, let's keep reading here. The Bible says in verse number 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wise be unto our husbands, in everything, the church is subject, right? We're, we are submissive to Christ and to his commands. Verse 25, husbands love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus Christ gave himself for the church. Again, another indication I would say, well, church is probably pretty important then. He gave himself for the body. He gave himself for the church to exist, for us to congregate together as believers in him. Jesus Christ bled and died for the church. He loves church so much that he gave himself for it. If Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for church, do you think he might be able to show up once in a while or maybe make it a little bit more of a priority than just once in a while and say, you know, if Jesus Christ loved the church so much that he gave his own life for it, maybe I will be part of the body on a regular basis and it'll be important and I'll show up and I'll be here. Verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So here we see another aspect of church. Why, why does Christ want us all to come together? He says, well, I want the church to be holy to not have any blemishes. So when you come to church, one of the reasons for coming to church, among many, is that God wants us to get cleaned up. He wants us to clean up our act. He wants us to get sin out of our life. That's why if you're going to church that isn't preaching hard and preaching against sin, you're not in a good church. How in the world are we going to be presented spotless and be sanctified and everything else if we're not even being taught what's wrong. Where are the spots? Where are the blemishes? What is it that I need to work on? Well, that's why Jesus Christ wants us to come in church. He says he wants you to be cleansed with the washing of the water by the word. There should be a lot of the word, God's word being taught, the instruction coming clearly to the church because those are the words of Christ. That's the instruction that we need. It's not my opinion. It's not anyone else's opinion. It's what the, the, the Word says. 
This is the instruction that we need. We need to hear this. We need to be sanctified so that the church can be glorious. It could be presented to himself. Glorious, without spot, without wrinkle, without these imperfections. He wants us cleaned up. And you're going to get that by coming to church. You're going to hear the, what, what God wants for us. Hopefully, I mean, again, you're in the right church. You're going to be hearing what, uh, and this is God's will, that this is what would be done in church. Verse 28, So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. God loves the church. Again, we're seeing this again, how much love the Lord has for the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his his bones. So the way he's relating that how husbands ought to love their wife, because you're one flesh, you come together, you're one person. He's saying that the same way you ought to be loving your wife is the way that God loves the church because we are part of his body. Because that's what, again, the church is. We see another reference that the church being the body of Christ. It's important. We need to be in and be part of it. You need to make it a priority in your life. And that's why he says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. A lot of great teaching, a lot of great doctrine coming from Ephesians chapter 5 there. You don't have to turn or turn if you want to do Colossians chapter 1. We're just going to see a few more uh, places there just about us being the body, another scriptural reference. But in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, And I, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church in the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus Christ is the one building the church. It's not left up for man to build the church. It's his body. He's the head and he's building it and he wants people where he wants them to be in his body. He's going to build the church. We ought to recognize that first of all and it's, it should never come into our mind and say, well, how can we grow the church and start thinking of ways outside of the head's instruction on how to do it. Because if we just go to our own wisdom, what are we going to start thinking? Well, let's see, how are we going to build this church? Well, what do people like? What's going to draw people in? I know people are really into this type of music. If we just start playing this music, a lot more people want to show up. I know People love to be told how good they are. They want to feel good about themselves. If we start preaching on God's love every single service and just tell them, how great, you know what, we're going we're gonna to build a great church here. It's not our job to do that. And that's going against the instruction of the head, which is going to turn it into just some other body with Jesus Christ not at the head. You're not taking the instructions from him. But not only that, the Bible, when he says, I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Don't we want to be in a place that's that solid and that strong that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? Well, I make sure I'm part of that. I want to be part of that body. I want to be in that body as much as possible. There's confidence. That's, that's a bold statement. And Jesus Christ was saying it so we know it's true absolutely without a shadow of a doubt. Shall not prevail against it. Colossians 1, look at verse number 18. Paul says, And he is the head of the body, the church. This is the body, comma, the church. It's defining what the body is. The church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jump down to verse number 24. Who now rejoicing in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, Whose bodies? Christ's, which is the church. Again, another definition of Christ's body being the church, whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So there's plenty of other passages, and we're not going to go to them all just for sake of time. It's pretty easy to get the context. Just from Colossians 1, Ephesians 5, there's so many other places that refer to the body being the church. And you let that sink in, just being the body of Christ. And instead of just saying flippantly, well, should I go to church today? Do I want to be a part of, God, of Christ's body today? 
It's another way of looking at it, but it might put a little bit of different perspective on it of how important it actually is. You might even start to get excited about it. Saying, wow, the church is coming together tomorrow. The church is coming together in a few days. The body of Christ. Let's all be a part of that body. And you're going to start looking for the other members and caring for the other members of the body because you care about how everyone's doing because you want the whole body functioning properly. That's what the church is about. It's a great church. And look, I'm not preaching this because I think we have some major problem with the church. This is actually just a very basic doctrine. And I'm thankful for everyone that has this type of mentality and mindset already. I know it exists. And this is what the church is supposed to be, but we want to never lose sight of that. Let's keep this being the, you know, a very, very, very important part of our life. And I'll tell you what, besides all of the scripture that we have on the importance of this, you see it firsthand. If you spend any amount of time in a good church, you will see people come and go. You'll see the revolving door. I've seen it plenty of times. It's sad, but so many times I see that start from people who let other things just get in the way and take a priority over something as you might see as something as small as church. Now we, in this church, practice uh, or hold our congregation three times a week. We have Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, and a Wednesday evening service. We do that three times. We come together as a body, as a church. And it is important. Every single service is important. We don't do that. I'll tell you what, we don't do that. We don't do that just to say, well, you know, if you're busy on this time, you could go on this time. Like, this isn't just some service just to try to get you to attend one of the services. That's not why we have three different church services during, in one given week. That's not the reason. Now, especially with new believers, if it's going to be convenient for them, great. We're not trying to make church inconvenient by any means. But the reason why we have multiple church services because we think that it's actually very important to be hearing the Word of God more than just one time a week. We try to make the timing convenient, as convenient as possible so that people can work, you can do other things, and still make it to church. But I'll tell you what, you still have to make a commitment and a dedication that you're going to be there. When I go to my job interviews, because I'm, I'm interviewing to get another job outside of pastoring a church, Every single time without fail, what I'm telling them is, you know, if they're asking me to do some on-call work, if they're asking me to do any hours, overtime, anything like that, you know where my priority is? I says, well, and it's not just because I'm the pastor of the church, okay? I, I've had this attitude for years and years before I ever became a pastor is that I cannot work Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Now, if you need me to work on a Sunday afternoon, you want me to work on a Saturday, you want me to work on any other time, any other day, Fine. But this is my priority. This is where I'm saying, this is where I'm going to be in church. Why? Because church is that important. And I don't care how much money they want to pay me. You can pay me a million dollars a year and I will not sacrifice. And even as a pastor, I won't just go and change our church schedule for me to get that job. I'm not going to do it. We're going to stay solid and we're going to stay steady and this is going to, the way it's going to be and just because of the importance that ought to be placed on coming together and hearing from the Word of God. The Bible says that um, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but that we're supposed to come together and it says so much the more as you see the day approaching. You want to know why we have three church services? The Bible says we need church so much the more as we see the day approaching. It's talking about the day of Christ. That day when as the world continues to devolve into this wickedness and sin and gets degrade, degraded and, and we live in a more and more wicked society, we need more and more church. 
We need to come together more often. We need to come together and edify and encourage and hear instruction and do what's right as the world gets more and more wicked. That's why we have it. And also in Colossians 1, verse number 18, we already read this, but uh, one point I didn't, I didn't point out here. It says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus Christ gets the preeminence. He's the first. That's what ought to be the first thing that comes to our mind when we're making our decisions, when we're deciding and making priorities. Well, who gets, who gets the first of my time? Who gets the first of my priorities? Jesus Christ does. I think he deserves it. I think, you know, dying on the cross and paying for all my sins. Yeah, I think he deserves my whole life. I think he deserves everything and anything that I can give him. How about at least making church a priority? At the very least. Can we do that? Can we at least just say, Christ, you're worth it for me to at least attend. And, and you know what? I'm going to make it a point to show up to church on a regular basis and be, and be part of your body so that I can receive the instruction and direction on what you want me to do with my life. Three to thrive is the motto that we have here. But the world will look at you as crazy. Especially if you'd like, you know, pass up that promotion or that job. I mean, I'm not taking any job that's going to require me to travel, not just because I think it's important for me to be around my, my family, which that is important, and I'm not, you know, preaching against people who travel for their job or anything, but usually when you have to travel, it requires you being out of church. Now, I know people can travel and they can visit other churches in different locations. That's great. I don't have a problem with that. But I mean, me personally, I can't do that being the pastor of this church. I'm going to make sure I'm here um, for the Wednesday night service because I've made a commitment to that and that is a priority for me. But the world will look at you as crazy. The world will look at you as crazy, especially if you move to another area because of church, right? You have people that have moved physically, locations. We have some people in our church that I know right now are looking to move just even within Georgia just to be closer to church. They're just looking to pick up and move let alone people who are talking about moving from other places, from other states, from other countries even, to come and be a part of a good church. Why? Because that's a priority to them. They want to be in the best church that they can be a part of. And it's, that, it's so important to them that they're willing to, to lift up and transplant and move. And this is what, again, the world, they're not going to understand that. So be prepared if you make church that much of a priority for you. You're going you're gonna to receive it. You're going to hear it from people, especially those that are unsaved. But it usually comes from the family members. When I made the decision personally in my own life of how important church was to me, I heard it from family members. Usually it was around holidays. And I, I find this the most ironic of all. When I go and visit family for Christmas, and, you know, when Christmas falls on a Tuesday or a Monday, it's never a problem, right? Because at least in the churches I've been to, the churches I go to, Baptist churches, we have church service Sunday two times and Wednesday one time. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night has been what I've always gone and been used to. And when there's holidays, the, the schedule doesn't change. We're going to church. So when I go and visit, if church falls on a Sunday or a Wednesday, Oh, but the family's all getting together. Yeah, but I'm going to church. And it's like, of all the days in the year, we're supposed to be celebrating Christ and his birth, right? Or his resurrection. You know, it's like, how are we not going to, you know, you're going to give me a hard time about going to church, the body of Christ that we're celebrating, and then going to family before or after and kind of, you know, adjusting the schedule to that. How can that be a bad thing? But a lot of people won't understand it. But God understands it. And I think that it's a very good thing to do, an important decision to make, just to make church that much of a priority in your life. Now, church life is the title of my sermon. So just in your church attendance alone, going to church more than once a week is going to look weird and peculiar and different to people. I know it was for me coming from a Presbyterian background. We went to church once a week on Sunday morning and that was it. And that's what I was used to. That's what I grew up with. That was a tradition. It's just, okay, go to church once a week. It didn't take me very long before um, 
I wanted to go, you know, then it was like, I didn't even want to go to church once a week, right? I wasn't saved, church was boring, didn't want to be there. I get it. But when you get in a good church that's motivating and exciting and edifying, hey, why wouldn't you want to come to more church services? You don't, we're not coming to church. And I tell you, I, hopefully, you're not just coming to church to just check it off the box and say, well, I went to church this week. I did my good deed. I'm just trying to make sure I'm in God's good graces enough, so I'm going to go to church once a week. Now, you can go to church once a week or twice a month or whatever, right? Whatever you decide to do, and the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You could say, well, I'm not forsaking it. I'm still going. Fine. Okay? That, that's between you and God, what, where the line is. I mean, where is the line where you say you're forsaking church? Is it once a year? Well, I go to church on Christmas. I'm not forsaking church because I'm going on Christmas. I think you're forsaking church. You're going once a year. You might as well just not go at all. I mean, that's as far as what, what I think that God's going to look at that as, he's not going to think you're doing him any, any, you know, any special sacrifice or offering by going to church once a year. But again, you, you can decide for yourself. And, and again, just, just determine how much Jesus is important to you and being a part of that, that body of Christ. The choices you're going to make, you know, we don't have any rules here. I'm not, I'm not going to be harassing you or on you. you, you know, you're only coming to church this day or that day. I don't even know. Come to church when you, when you want to come to church, but I'm just teaching that I believe it ought to be a very big priority and we ought to view it as such. Moving on here, the second aspect of church life that will make you look peculiar is soul winning. Soul winning. Trying to win souls to Christ and actually making time in your schedule to go out and knock on doors of people you don't even know and talk about Jesus Christ. Now, we definitely ought to be talking, giving the gospel to families and friends you know, uh, whenever we can. But I think above and beyond that, we are called to and we are supposed to, turn if you would to Acts chapter 4, we are commanded to go out and preach the gospel to the lost, not just to family and friends, not just when it's convenient, but to actually go out take the time, put it aside and say, no, we are going to do this right now. We're going to obey God's command. We're going to obey the head, Jesus Christ, in his command to go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're actually going to listen to him and do it. And by coming to church is where you're going to hear that instruction. You're going to get that instruction to even go out and do the work. Romans 10 says, and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach except they be sent? The church is going to be sending you, hopefully at least the right church is going to be sending you to go out and preach the gospel. Because people aren't going to have faith unless they hear it. And they're not going to hear it unless someone preaches it to them. They're not going to get it preached to unless someone's sending them to do it. But you're in Acts chapter 4. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. And isn't this just the, the kind of the motto of the world anyways? The world that we live in. Oh, you can't talk about religion or politics. Right? Don't talk, don't talk about religion. Don't do it. Speak no more in that name. Why? Because we just all want to get along. The world is so scared and, and snowflake, especially these days. You, you, they don't want you talking anything about religion. Oh, we can't have any disruption. We can't have any disagreements or any you know, fights. Now, we're going to be fighting, but we are in a spiritual fight. You'll be a peculiar people. You're not going to listen to the command not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus from the world, from the people who hate God, from, from anybody who's trying to tell you not to do what Christ is telling you to do. Verse number 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And there again, goes with putting your priorities right. 
Is your priority in dedication to the Lord? Or is it just to, to some man or some woman or whoever in your life? You say, well, you can judge for yourself. You, 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 here you guys are telling us not to preach to Jesus, about Jesus. And we have God telling us something different. Why don't you just judge for yourself who, who you think we're going to listen to and who's more important, whose authority is going to trump whose authority. Look at verse number 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So we can't help it. We've seen these things. We've heard these things. We were with Christ. We saw his resurrection. We saw, you know, we witnessed. We heard everything. We can't, we can't help ourselves. But we have to talk about it. And we're going to obey God rather than men. Turn it to Acts chapter number 5. Very famous passage. Acts chapter 5, the last verse in Acts chapter 5. Soul winning is actually a really big deal for, for being a peculiar people. If we're going to be set apart, if we're going to be sanctified under the service of the Lord, this is critical. And it ought to be a part of your life. It ought to be given a priority like church is given a priority. One of my priorities is to get more people to follow this command, which is why we don't just have, even though we have one official soul winning time, I'm going to continually remind you that when we go through our announcements every week, Hey, guess what? If that time doesn't work for you, I will go out with you on another time. And I'll just, just let me know. Because it's that important. And if one simple thing as in this time isn't going to work for whatever reason, is going to keep you from going soul winning, I'll work around that. Don't let that keep you from going and doing this very, very important work that we're called to do, that, that, that really our life should be about is, is just reaching the lost and, and spreading the good news and giving that gift of the gospel and leading other people to Christ. The most important thing, event that's happened in your entire life is God saving your soul. We need to be sharing that with others so that their soul could be saved too. Act 5 verse 42 says, And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And what's interesting, what I love about this verse is that oftentimes it's not given with the context. And when you go up earlier in the passage, you're going to see that they're being beaten again. They're being persecuted again for preaching Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council, right? The, the government brings them in. The people in charge, the rulers are bringing them in and they're, they're threatening them. They're beating them. They're, they're persecuting them. And they go in before this council and they're told, you can't preach that way. And then they leave the council. It says rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And did that stop them at all? Not according to verse 42. It's just daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now this is our example in the New Testament. The disciples ceasing not to teach and preach Jesus Christ as to what we're to do. And they were able to do it even with the threatenings and imprisonments and beatings and we live in the United States of America today where we have religious freedom. And while there is certain persecutions, it is nothing compared. You are not being thrown in jail today for preaching the gospel in the United States of America. It's not happening here. You're not being beaten. It's not happening. People aren't being put to death and martyred in the United States because you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they're able to do it and not stop and not cease and do it daily from house to house, in the temple, everywhere, just preaching the good news, why can't you? Why can't you make it a priority? 
Make it a priority even once a week. How about one hour a week? How about that? Start with something like that. Start with just going out once, going out the first time. You haven't gone out and done it before. Start there. But start. Make it important. Put it, put it to the forefront of the things that you need to do. Don't put it on the back burner. It's too important for that. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter number four. I'm going to move on. Obviously, some of these, sub, these topics, we can, I can, you know, they're entire sermons in and of themselves, but I kind of wanted to wrap and bundle the, some of these up. While we're going through this series, another aspect of what, what I consider to be church life, just for back of a, lack of a better term, is your prayer. And this isn't a whole sermon about prayer. You could go, again, it's, there's, there's a lot to cover when it comes to prayer. But what I'm talking about prayer is the open prayer. Not being ashamed, not being embarrassed, and just being able to pray to God. You know, I mean, we pray in church, what I call it church life, but our church life ought to extend outside of church. It ought to be a part of our life. You ought to have the mentality of church life throughout your day-to-day -day life. Philippians 4, verse 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. This one simple verse shows us how much we ought to be praying. I mean, in, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We ought to have a lot of requests, a lot of things that we're going to God for. And if that's the case, you know, usually you're not going to just be praying necessarily at one time throughout the day. Now, when I'm talking about open prayer, or praying out loud, praying in public, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about what Jesus was condemning in Matthew chapter six. There's a big difference here. I just want to cover that real quick. Uh, you have to turn a few to Daniel chapter six. Because I'm referring more to the Daniel style of praying than the, the Pharisaical style of praying. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said in verse number 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, again, this is one aspect of prayer where Jesus is saying, look, you don't have to pray in public. Just go ahead and pray in your closet. No one else can hear you, but God will hear you. It's a very important teaching. It's understanding, you know, it doesn't matter the place that you're in. God can hear you. And not just that, the, what he's condemning in verse number five is the Pharisees who the reason they were praying is not to be heard of God, but to be heard of men. That was what their heart was all about. They wanted to look holy and righteous in other people's eyes. So they're being condemned for that because that's not the purpose for praying. That's not why you do it at all. But you think about these guys, they just, they want to be heard. They want people to think in their minds, wow, what a holy, what a holy man of God. Oh, wow, he speaks so well. He prays so well. And get this, this praise of men with their, with their, with their, their great speeches and orations and their prayers to God. That's not what it's about at all. And, and just, just so you don't get me wrong, it's not what I'm talking about in the slightest. But when you pray in public because you're giving God thanks for your food, that's way different than praying just so people can hear you. I mean, this is, this is something that many people have incorporated in their life is that, you know, before every meal, you ask for a blessing on the food, you give God thanks. That's a pretty normal thing to do. We can see that found throughout Scripture. But my point and what I'm trying to communicate here is that just because you're out in public and people might look at you and think you're weird or look down on you or make a comment or whatever, that shouldn't stop you from doing what you believe is right. 
from giving God the thanks, from opening up your mouth and speaking from your heart and, and thanking God for what you have and asking him to bless your food. Now, I'm new to Georgia, so maybe this isn't as big of a deal here in the Bible Belt of people praying for you. Maybe it's more common. I don't know. But some of the areas that I've been to, people look at you and think you're, you're you know, weird or old. You know, look at this guy. I don't, it doesn't matter. The point is you shouldn't worry about what other people think around you. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed. That is a shame if you are ashamed to, to have communication with the Savior. The one that saved your soul. If you're, if you're ashamed to be seen like praying to God, then shame on you. Daniel chapter 6. Of course, when, when um, these wicked people were trying to find fault with Daniel, they had a law signed that, says, that, that said you can't Basically, you can't pray to God without going to the king first. Like, if you want to make a request or a petition made to God, nope, you got to go through the king first and get it approval. <laughs> you got to go to the state, go to the government, and get a license to pray. Daniel's like, I don't think so. No one can come between you and God. You go, you go, the, the, only, the only mediator that we have between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. That is the only mediator that we have. Daniel 6.10, the Bible says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So he went into his house, but it's the Bible Bible's making it really clear that whatever he did before, the way that he prayed before, he didn't change what he was doing. He wasn't, didn't change it to comply. He didn't hide what he was doing. He also, he didn't go out to make some public statement about it either. He just said, well, I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. I'm going to keep praying to God. I'm not going to close my windows. I'm not going to hide it. I'm just going to do what I've been doing. And if they hear me, so be it. And of course, they hear him and they get him in trouble. But then God delivers him as always. Now, um, the last point I want to make here with church life is just daily Bible reading. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. And again, there's many verses we could turn to about how important it is to read your Bible every day. You look at the references to manna and what Jesus Christ said when the devil is tempting him. How he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. That, that every word is important and we're supposed to be treating the word of God as our life, as our sustenance, as the things that we need. It's something we ought to do. So if that means you have to carry your Bible around in order to read the Bible, again, out in public, don't be ashamed of it. Don't be afraid of it. Just do it. But another reason why this is going to set you apart and make you a peculiar people if you read your Bible every day is because almost nobody reads their Bible every day. Even among believers, and especially among those that call themselves Christian, people aren't reading their Bibles. Definitely not on a regular basis. And this will set you apart, but yet it's so critical and so fundamental and so foundational. But again, it has to go with your mindset about it. How important is it to you? Are you going to make it a priority in your life? Like you're going to make church a priority. Like you're going to make winning other people to Christ a priority. Like you're going to make your prayer unto God a priority. Are you going to, are you going to take reading his word and hearing from him and receiving instruction a priority for you? Are you going to make it a, something that I will not go to bed tonight or I will not start my day or I will not do whatever without hearing from God first? Not going to let it happen. It's not going to slip by. It is too important for me. I'd rather skip a meal than skip my time getting from, from God's word. That's the type of importance that we're talking about here to become a peculiar people. And you know what? That'll be evident in and of itself. You will be a peculiar person when you read every day because you're actually going to know what the Bible says for yourself. And hopefully that'll be coming out then in your communication with other people, just the knowledge and wisdom that you receive from God's word. And you would be like, oh, I never heard that before. It's because you're not reading your Bible. 
And again, it's not to go and one up people or to lift yourself up with pride because, oh, I'm so knowledgeable, I read the Bible. No, it's just you will be a much wiser person and it will just be evident that you know the Bible when you're reading it every day. John 6, verse 63, Jesus said, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words of Jesus, he says, they are life. The word of God is the word of life. Is reading God's word a chore and a battle and a struggle? Or are you viewing it as these are the words of life? I mean, this is good for me. We ought to, and if you don't have that attitude, well, let's work on getting it right. Okay, nobody's perfect. We still have the flesh. I understand the battle. I'm not going to get stand up here today and tell you that I have every single one of my priorities always right all the time and that the flesh never comes in between the things that I'm supposed to be doing. It's there, but we need to be aware of that and prepare for that and still just set ourselves in your heart and in your mind ready to just to make this unstoppable, unbreakable, unmovable that you will have this type of a mindset and that even if it does become some type of a chore, you're still going to do it anyways. You know, obviously the, the best scenario is that your heart is right, you're walking in the spirit and you're going to love receiving this life of God's word. But when you've got your priorities set right, even when it doesn't feel good or it's not convenient or you've got something else going on, the priority that you've set in your heart, that you've already established is going to make you do it anyways. You wake up in the morning and I don't really feel like going to church today. Doesn't matter. I'm going to go anyways. Man, I'm super tired. I didn't get a chance to read my Bible this morning. I just want to go to sleep. Doesn't matter. I'm going to read it anyways. You just do it because it's important. Because church life for us isn't left at church until the next week. That's what so many people hate about church. And rightfully so is the hypocrisy. We go out and knock on doors. I can't tell you how many people I run into. The reason why they don't go to church anymore is because of all the hypocrites. Because they go to places where people want to put on their fancy clothes for that one day. They want to talk the spiritual talk. They want to sound like they're all spiritual and they've got it all together. And, and you know, put off this impression that they're so holy and then the same day or the next day, they're just right back into the world doing everything everyone else does, living in sin, doing whatever they want to do. And then they come into church and these people, they see that and they recognize that. And they're like, well, who, who are you? Well, what makes you think that you're so great and so special? Because they're giving off that air and that attitude that they are. And it's fake. It's a facade. They're just putting up a front because they're in church, because they think that this is the way that we need to act in church. Well, that's not the way things are here. You're not going to be fooling anyone. You're definitely not going to be fooling God. I mean, you might be able to fool me or fool some other people. Okay, what does that accomplish for you? You, you tricked somebody into making them think that, that you're so holy and super special. Okay. It's not going to do you any good. People can tell when, when there's sincerity and when, and when things are genuine. And this church is a genuine church. People love the Lord and want to and serve Him. And that's why we're here. And that's what it's about. It's, it's sincerity. It's with, with truth. Jesus Christ railed on the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 14. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. He said, They weren't praying to God in truth and honesty and sincerity. It was just for a big show. It was just a pretense. Just like Joel Osteen isn't doing anything because he has integrity with God. You know, these false prophets out there and these prosperity preachers, they're not doing it because they actually care and, and, and care about the Word of God and they treat it as something so important. They care about money. 
They don't care about people. So they'll do whatever they can do to make more money. And they're wicked people. They don't, care. they don't care how much they bastardize the Word of God in order to do so and just ignore it and lie to people. It's disgusting, but that's what Jesus was against what the Pharisees were doing. They're hypocrites. There's a lot of hypocrites out there today, but it's putting a bad taste in people's mouth about church because they see they, maybe they get deceived by these charlatans and then they find out what they're really about and they're just like, well, what do I want to have anything to do with that? It's another reason why it's so important to not be like that because people need to realize that's not how everybody is. There are snakes out there. There are devils out there, but that's not how everyone is. Maybe you've been to a few different churches before and they're all just, just exuding hypocrisy. But that's not how all churches are. 1 Peter 2, 1, you have to turn to the Bible, says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted the Lord, that the Lord is gracious. The instruction is to, to lay aside guile, hypocrisies, and to honestly desire the sincere milk of the word. That's how we're going to grow. It's not a show. We're not here to put on a show. We're here to be a body and to work together and to have one spirit and to have one mind and to do a work for our boss, which is Jesus Christ, the head. That's why we're here. Sincerely, honestly, not out to deceive. Because we put, made it a priority to be part of this body. We made it a priority to go out and do the work that the head says and to lead people to him and try to, to do the work that he says and to hear the instruction from him and to speak and communicate with God through prayer no matter where we're at, no matter what's going on, that we put this a priority. Church life. You practice what's taught here and you will be a peculiar people, but you know what? Praise God because that's what he's called us to be. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that we received from your words, God. I pray that you would please help us. We are sincere here, Lord. This church... I know firsthand is, is full of people that love you. We want to do our best for you, dear God. We're not perfect. We are imperfect vessels, as you very well know. But Lord, we're trying our best, and we just desire to, to receive more instruction from you. Give us the wisdom that we need. Stir up our spirits. Stir up our hearts, dear Lord. Help us to care for one another and edify one another that we can do even more. Help us to prioritize our life that we're, that we're doing the things that we need to do and treating um, these various aspects of, of our church life and giving it the, the right important, importance that they need to have. God, help us to battle our flesh and to walk in the Spirit evermore. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.